Hello, welcome to this third and final podcast in the module concerning financial support of children. In this podcast, we will examine two areas that are convenient to deal with together, but other than the fact that they both relate to financial support of children, aren't particularly related. They are child support agreements and a brief discussion concerning the remaining jurisdiction of a court under the Family Law Act. The Child Support Assessment Act has provisions for two different types of agreements. One is called a limited child support agreement, the other is a binding child support agreement. Each type of agreement has different formalities, different circumstances in which the agreement will be binding, and different grounds for terminating or setting aside the agreement. We will start though with limited child support agreements. Section 80 capital E subsection 1 of the Child Support Assessment Act sets out the requirements for an agreement to be a limited child support agreement. It must be A. In writing B. Signed by the parties C. Properly dealing with children the subject of the Child Support Assessment Act and appropriately dealing with child support matters and also Section 80E subsection 2 says that generally there must be A. An existing child support assessment in place and B. That the annual child support payable under the agreement is at least the annual rate of child support that would otherwise be payable. That is, the amount under the agreement needs to be greater than the existing assessment. There's no strict obligation in the Child Support Assessment Act for anyone to actually register the agreement, whether that agreement is a limited agreement or a binding agreement. However, Sections 98 capital U and Section 93 of the Child Support Assessment Act tell us what the obligations of the Child Support Agency are once an application is made for acceptance of the agreement and the effect of the agreement once it is accepted by the Child Support Agency. First, if the agreement meets the legislative requirements, then the agreement must be accepted. Second, once the agreement is accepted, it then takes the place of a child support assessment. The importance of this is that once registered, and of course if necessary, the Child Support Agency has all the powers of collection and enforcement of child support that it would otherwise have under a child support assessment. Without successful registration of the agreement, the Child Support Agency has no power. Section 80G of the Child Support Assessment Act provides a large number of grounds under which a limited child supreme child support agreement can be terminated. The basic ones, and there is a complex one to follow, are set out in front of you. They are the signing of a new limited child support agreement, the signing of a new binding child support agreement, an agreement between the parties simply terminating the limited child support agreement, the setting aside of an agreement under section 136 of the Child Support Assessment Act, or if the agreement is more than three years old, then simply by one person providing notice to the other of the termination of the agreement and then providing evidence of that notice to the Child Support Agency. At the time that an application is made to the Child Support Agency for acceptance of an agreement, the Child Support Agency conducts what is known as a notional assessment if you like, a hypothetical calculation of what might have been payable if a new assessment had issued on that day. This is to make sure that the amount payable under the limited child support agreement is more than the amount that would have been payable under the assessment. If subsequent to acceptance of agreement, the agreement, the notional assessment varies more than 15%, then the limited child support agreement can be terminated. Now I'll translate that for you into some plain English. At any time after the limited child support agreement is registered, a person can apply to the child support agency for a notional assessment. That's in section 146, capital F, subsection B. The child support agency will then conduct that notional, remember it's hypothetical, assessment using updated information, for example, a person's updated taxable income. 
The Child Support Agency will then send the notional assessment out to the parties. If the amount calculated under the notional assessment is 15% or more different compared to the agreement that has been registered, then, using perhaps some old-fashioned language, the original agreement is voidable, that is, capable of termination by either of the parties. Section 136 of the Child Support Assessment Act needs to be read very carefully. I suggest that you take a direct look at section 136 using the link on your Blackboard page um, or otherwise by any other means. It covers the circumstances in which child support agreements can be set aside. Some of the paragraphs of section 136 relate to agreements whether they are limited child support agreements or binding child support agreements. Some of the paragraphs specifically relate to limited agreements and some specifically relate to binding agreements. In relation to all types of agreements, a court may set aside an agreement if a court is satisfied that a party's agreement was obtained by fraud or failure to disclose material information, or that another party to the agreement or someone acting for the other party exerted undue influence or duress in obtaining that agreement, or engaged in unconscionable or other conduct to such an extent that it would be unjust not to set aside the agreement. Section 136, subsection 2, paragraph C, specifically and only relates to limited child support agreements. A court may set aside a limited child support agreement if, because of a significant change in the circumstances of one of the parties to the agreement, or a child in respect of whom the agreement is made, it would be unjust not to set aside the agreement, or that the agreement provides for an annual rate of child support that is not proper or adequate, taking into account all of the circumstances of the case, including the financial circumstances of the parties to the agreement. Let's turn to binding child support agreements. The requirements for entry into binding child support agreements are quite onerous and quite different to limited child support agreements. Section 80 capital C subsection 2 provides, that's of the Child Support Assessment Act, provides that for an agreement to be binding, the agreement must A, be in writing, B, signed by the parties to the agreement, C, the agreement must contain, in relation to each party to the agreement, a statement to the effect that the party to whom this statement relates has been provided before the agreement was signed by him or her, as certified in an annexure to the agreement, with independent legal advice from a legal practitioner as to the effect of the agreement on the rights of that party and the advantages and disadvantages at the time the advice was provided of the party making the agreement. And the annexure to the agreement provides, or contains rather, a certificate signed by the person providing the independent legal advice stating the advice was provided and the agreement has not otherwise been terminated and after the agreement is signed either the original agreement or a copy of the agreement is given to each party. Section 80 capital D sets out some equally onerous requirements for termination of a binding child support agreement. There are only three ways in which a binding child support agreement can be terminated. These are set out in section 80 capital D subsection 1. They are a a provision being included in a new binding child support agreement made by the parties to the effect that the previous binding agreement is terminated, or b, the parties to the previous binding agreement making a written agreement called a termination agreement, or a court setting aside the previous agreement under section 136. Section 80 capital D subsection 2, that is, the provisions about a termination agreement, are written in precisely the same terms in, as section 80 capital C. In other words, to validly terminate a binding child support agreement, all of the advice and formalities requirements, such as independent legal advice, annexures, an exchange of an agreement and a copy, must be completed. You'll recall from a moment ago that section 136 sets out the grounds on which any agreement can be set aside, such as fraud or undue influence. 
There is one ground that specifically relates to binding agreements, which is contained in section 136, subsection 2, paragraph D. That ground is set out on your slide, that is, exceptional circumstances and the existence of hardship. Before I move on to the Family Law Act, you might consider in what situation each type of agreement might be used. A limited child support agreement is best used, for example, where parents agree that one parent might pay additional expenses, say, school or medical expenses, for a period of time, but where there is not sufficient certainty about earning capacity or finances and or job security over the longer term. The notional assessment provisions work so that if something goes terribly wrong for the payer, or for that matter the payee, then the agreement can be terminated. Binding child support agreements are best used when a payer parent wishes to pay an amount less than what the child support assessment might have otherwise been, or perhaps nothing at all, or perhaps a lump sum in substitution for child support over a period of time, or a lump sum as part of a greater property settlement. In those circumstances, the formalities and advice requirements are there to ensure that parents fully understand the effect of such agreements before entering into them. The last part of this module is a brief look at the circumstances in which the Family Law Act applies. You might recall from the very first podcast in this module that the Family Law Act only now applies in limited situations. They are when financial support is required for a child over 18 years, where support is sought from a step-parent, where the payer lives in an overseas jurisdiction without treaty arrangements with Australia, and the very rarely used application for expenses in relation to a child's birth. The Child Support Assessment Act ends once a child turns 18 years old. This is described as a child support terminating event in Section 12 of the Child Support Assessment Act. A parent then only has a legal obligation to maintain a child if the family law requirements are set out, are met. Those two factual situations are set out in Section 66 capital L of the Family Law Act. They are either A, to enable a child to complete his or her education, which may be secondary or tertiary education, or B, because of a disability of a child. You may imagine a situation where, for example, a child who becomes an adult but, owing to a disability, requires lifelong care, would need, be, would need to be supported by both parents. It is just that situation which occurred in the 2014 decision of Everett, which is discussed at page 563 of your prescribed textbook. In Everett, the child, who was an adult, uh, not only suffered from a disability, but was also enrolled at university full time. The evidence was sufficiently clear in relation to this child that she was not going to be able to meet her own reasonable needs and required support from both of her parents. Everett makes some interesting reading. There is some discussion in Everett about the existence or lack of a relationship between the child being supported and the adult being asked to support the child. Note that the court may make an order in relation to a child over 17 years of age that will take effect once the child turns 18 years of age. Under the Child Support Assessment Act, only a parent can be the person paying child support. If financial support is sought from a presumably former step-parent, then an application can be made under the Family Law Act. It is the parents, however, who have a primary obligation to support a child. A step-parent will only have such a duty in very limited circumstances. Section 66D, and then remember this is about the Family Law Act, says that the step-parent of a child has, subject to this division, the duty of maintaining a child if and only if a court, by order under Section 66 capital M of the Family Law Act, determines that it is proper for the step-parent to have that duty. Section 66 M2 of the Family Law Act says that any duty of a step-parent to maintain a stepchild is a, a secondary duty, subject to the primary duty of the parents of the child to maintain the child, and b, does not derogate 
from the primary duty of the parents to maintain the child. Section 66 capital M of the Family Law Act provides that in making an order for a step parent to maintain a child, there are additional factors to take into account, being the length and circumstances of the marriage to or relationship with the relevant parent of the child, the relationship that existed between the step parent and the child, the arrangements that have existed for the maintenance or child support of the child, and E, any special circumstances which, if not taken into account in the particular case, would result in injustice or undue hardship to any person. For a more detailed discussion of the issues concerning step parents and also applications for childbearing expenses, take a look at the discussion at pages 563 to 564 of your prescribed textbook. That's it for this third podcast and also ends module 8. Thanks very much for listening. Bye for now and see you next time.